The two main contemporary schools of Zen in the West are Soto and Rinzai. We're within the Soto tradition, and these remarks pertain solely to Soto, whose primary practice is Zazen, Zazen, seated meditation. So what is Zazen? Well, it isn't a mysterious Japanese way to personal enlightenment involving koans, understood as deliberately incomprehensible stories and parables, although that was how Zen was originally received in the West post-war, due to writers such as D.T. Suzuki and Alan Watts. And neither is it within the more contemporary idea of meditation as self-improvement or meditation as personal growth, raising one's consciousness, refining and quietening the mind, and so on. It doesn't fit within our culture's dominant individualistic model of self-improvement, popularised by certain strands within the modern mindfulness movement or variants of that, such as the evolving consciousness ideas of Ken Wilbur and others. It's the polar opposite of striving to get something. So what is it? Well, it's quintessentially Chinese with an overlay of Japanese culture. It's clearly all of a piece with Buddhism, and its aim isn't personal enlightenment, but non-separation, healing the split between ourselves, other beings, and the world. I'd like to outline Zen's place within historic Buddhism, its development, and its central beliefs, and I would like to then give detailed observations about how you might practice Zazen. And after that, I'll try and explain ritual and practice. And I'm doing this so you can make an informed choice about whether this perspective makes sense to you. And I'm aware that's unusual. Introductions to meditation tend to focus on a meditation is good for you perspective. But unless we make an effort to understand Buddhism, it won't survive. It can survive persecution, but not absorption into the dominant Western individualistic perspectives of wellness and self-improvement. It can't be killed by its enemies, but it can be killed by kindness. The historical Buddha lived in northeast India around 500 BC. At that time, India was going through social change. Although still overwhelmingly agricultural, cities had started to form, and this had created new classes, and in turn, this had led to social and religious innovation. And at that time, the dominant spiritual outlook was Brahmanism, which held that we have an immortal soul imprisoned in a body which is continually reincarnating, and the function of spiritual life, therefore, is to liberate the soul from the body, often through practices of austerity or mortification. By contrast, in the cities, contrary materialistic philosophies were developing. Prior to his enlightenment experience, the Buddha had a small number of spiritual companions with whom he carried out these mortification practices that I've referred to. For some reason, one day he stopped these practices, distanced himself from his companions and just sat in meditation. And he then had his enlightenment experience. And after that, he gave two talks to these spiritual companions. Then he gave a talk to a bigger group of people. That's his first public talk. And that's the, called the fire sermon. In the first two talks, he explained his discovery that life was suffering, but there was a way out of this suffering, the Noble Eightfold Path. In the second talk, he explained his key insight, try as we might, we could not find a knowable fixed self. That being so, a new way of living was possible, one that was not centered on the needs and desires of the self. And that insight could be grounded in living differently in accordance with the Noble Eightfold Path. In the third, more public talk, he uses the metaphor of a fire to explain suffering. 
and this metaphor probably wasn't accidental, as rituals involving fire were a key aspect of Brahmanism. What we were required to do, he said in this sermon, to make the fire of suffering burn itself out, was to stop giving it fuel in the form of our desires and aversions, and then the fire would blow itself out. So the perspective of uh, Buddhism is uh, firstly that ordinary existence is characterised by suffering and impermanence, what we call samsara. Um, second, there's a way out of this suffering um, and that way is through living differently, through the Noble Eightfold Path, um, which is based on the understanding that there is no fixed, separate self. There's no primary dualism of self and world. And that different perspective is nirvana. And the Buddha called this the middle way because it's neither the ordinary life of the self, a life of craving and aversion, nor is it liberation of the soul or self through uh, aesthetic practices, because there is no identifiable separate continuing self. And the discovery of this no self is the key insight. And that was the fundamental difference between Buddhism and Brahmanism and its contemporaries, such as Jainism, because both uh, Brahmanism and Jainism emphasise the attainment of liberation through a struggle lasting many lifetimes. And that difference leads to the central difference. Buddhism is a discovery approach rather than an attainment approach. And the primary way of liberation is through meditation, as this gives the meditator direct access to experience, which is pre-self, pre-division, pre-subject and object. Nirvana isn't a place or an activity or an attainment or a goal. It's the stopping of the familiar constructions which cause us to suffer. So at the outset, the primary uh, insight is the emptiness of self. Now the sutras, um, the teachings of the Buddha, um, were transmitted orally and they weren't written down until about 400 years after the Buddha's death. But once they were, they could be compiled and compared. And at that point, different Buddhist schools arose. In the traditional accounts, 18, but probably a lot more. Now, these schools weren't philosophical schools. They were different, sincere attempts to describe not the world, but the world of meditation. And one of these schools based itself around the writings of Nagarjuna, uh, and that subsequently became part of the Mahayana, or Great Vehicle, uh, stream of Buddhism. Mahayana became dominant in China, Tibet, Korea and Japan, and Zen arose as part of this. Nagarjuna emphasised emptiness, that is, he universalised the idea of no self, so nothing had a self, i.e. everything was empty of a, an essence, and in consequence, Everything was interlinked, interdependent, impermanent, like waves in an ocean. So that's the second insight. Emptiness of self and emptiness of all beings. Everything is, inter is impermanent and interdependent. So Mahayana Buddhism um, emphasised um, emptiness or interdependence, uh, compassion, skillful means, and a focus on all beings rather than just the practitioner. The primary schools within Mahayana in India were Nagarjuna's school called the Majjhimika and the Yogacara school uh, which came slightly later. Because the emptiness teachings of Nagarjuna made 
objective truth statements about the world, which Nagarjuna called views, impossible. Uh, Mahayana, after Nagarjuna, evolved in an unusual way, paying attention to the nature of experience and how that experience could be developed away from a simple realism. Yogacara followed Nagarjuna. It's misleadingly called mind only or consciousness only because its focus is on that, but it's phenomenological. It's not uh, an idealistic um, philosophy. It's um, a phenomenological description of actual imposs and possible experience. The third strand of Mahayana um, is the Buddha nature perspective. And that's the belief that some or all beings are in some sense destined to be future Buddhas or have some essence of Buddha now, but that's covered over by ignorance. And that perspective fundamentally changed how the world was viewed from a world of beings and stuff to a world of bodhisattvas and Buddhas, and thus a profound emotional shift in how ourselves, other beings, and the world are viewed. In this perspective, although very influential, never crystallised into a school. The Mahayana produced a significant number of new sutras, the Vimalakirti Sutra, the Lotus Sutra, the Nirvana Sutra, the Langavatara Sutra, the Flower Garland Sutra, and many, many others. These extraordinary texts with their fantastical images expand our imaginal and emotional capacities and produce a shift in perspective. And that produces an emotional shift in how we view ourselves, other beings and the world. A bodhisattva, often misunderstood as a special being, is someone who can see other beings as bodhisattvas and who understands to some extent this vision of radical interdependence. A Buddha is a being who completely lives this interdependence. It's not the striving for something. It's not the attainment of something. It's letting all that go. So that's the third insight. Because everything is empty, everything matters. Reception of Buddhism into China was primarily via the Silk Road. Uh, sutras arrived in China haphazardly, so a major part of Chinese activity initially was to integrate divergent sutras into a coherent system, and to do that within a society very different from Indian society, a society where we have Confucianism, which emphasised the organic whole of society, and Taoism, which emphasised the organic, energetic wholeness of nature, including us. And that was in contrast to general Indian thought, which sought personal liberation from the world, which was generally viewed negatively. So the Mahayana practitioner in the world perspective chimed much more with the Chinese than more individualistic approaches. The Han Dynasty fell apart in 220 AD and the country wasn't united again until 581 under the Sui Dynasty and then from 618 to 906 the Tang Dynasty and that was perhaps the pinnacle of Chinese civilization, particularly in the period of the latter half of the 7th century to the extraordinary Empress Wu. The power and vitality of Imperial China started to decline after 740 AD and from that period uh, Zen started to emerge as a distinct school. And although um, Buddhism arrives in uh, China um, pretty near the start of the Common Era, it only starts to form distinctive Chinese characteristics around three or 400 AD, 
And starting from this point, meditation manuals are produced and there's a widespread translation of Indian texts, often sponsored by rulers. And towards the end of the 6th century, specifically Chinese schools start to form. Um, particularly the, the Tiantai or Tendai school and the Huayan school. And this um, Chinese perspective it involves a shift. Um, and that shift entails a positive view of the world, the general idea of Buddha nature, interdependence, an emphasis on suchness, and non-separation. It also involves the creation of new literature, such as the Heart Sutra, the treatise on awakening faith in the Mahayana, the Sutra of Perfect Enlightenment, and many other sutras, manuals and treatises, which are often erroneously attributed either to the Buddha or to other eminent Indian teachers. And within um, Chinese Buddhism, there are three strands which are dominant. Majjhimika, emphasizing emptiness, Yogacara, emphasizing mind only, and Buddha nature. These three strands are all subsumed within the new Chinese schools. If Zen in its classical form is a painting, underneath that painting is another painting, these indigenous Chinese schools of um, Tendai and Huayen. And underneath that painting are the three strands from India. So to understand the picture, you need to understand the depth. The Zen school, the meditation school, emerged within this broad new Chinese tradition. The earliest masters were clearly meditation teachers and appeared to base their teachings around the Langavatara Sutra, which combined the Yogacara and Buddha nature strands. A very prominent um, figure in the development of Zen uh, was Matsu or Basso, who lived between 709 and 788. And he, his school was one of five Zen schools at the time. And he was the creator of a more colloquial way of teaching. It was very rooted in Buddhist teachings, but he expressed these in a down-to-earth way. His other innovation was to introduce the idea of encounter between the teacher and the student as a form of teaching. And his successors maintained the colloquial style of Basso and the encounter teaching but neglected his deep immersion in the sutra literature. The success of Buddhism and its involvement in imperial politics, particularly after um, the Empress Wu was deposed, um, in due course led to the Buddhist suppression of 843. Uh, and after that, um, the Tang dynasty collapsed in 907, um, ushering in a chaotic period which ended with the establishment of the Song dynasty in 960 AD. The more established and institutional Buddhist schools foundered with this gradual collapse of the Tang dynasty, but Zen being peripheral and minor, both in terms of importance and in terms of geography, um, survived. Now, there was then this gap um, which was followed by the emergence of the Zen school of Basso as the dominant Buddhist school in the Song dynasty. And that involved the creation of a largely fictitious or heavily embellished past centering on a direct and continuous line of teachers from Bodhidharma, an Indian monk who was said to have brought Zen to China, which up to that point only just had a scholarly understanding of Buddhism. That claim is completely untrue. It also involved a recasting of the Tang dynasty Zen masters, primarily Basu and his successors such as Rinzai, as iconoclasts, and the creation and elaboration of koan literature, which was largely falsely attributed to them. And it also entailed the neglect of the sutras.
So this form of Zen had an emphasis on lineage, which mimicked imperial lineage, um, and that emphasis on lineage bolstered um, claims of the Zen masters to be living Buddhas. Um, and there was also related to that uh, an emphasis on the importance of dramatic spiritual breakthrough or Kensho. That's the source of our society's picture of Zen today. Iconoclastic, anti-intellectual, separate from Buddhism and paradoxical. But that notion of Zen wasn't unchallenged then and it's not unchallenged now. The Soto school derives from the Japanese Zen master Dogen who lived from 1200 to 1252. And Dogen studied in China, but his ideas are very different and his primary focus was in Zazen. The purpose of meditation is overcoming duality. We often think of duality as the mind-body split. And obviously, we need to quieten the mind as a first step. But quietening the mind isn't the goal of meditation. And it certainly isn't personal enlightenment either. Because non-duality, where is the self that enlightenment could adhere to? In Buddhism, non-duality primarily means healing the self-world split through various means. For the Soto school, it was shikantaza, which means just sitting. Not primarily in the sense of sitting without intention of gain, but sitting without the split between self and world. It's just sitting in the sense that the person and the world are one piece. Meditation, Zazen, is preeminent because it's the best way to heal the split. <laughs> 